Okay. Good afternoon, members of the media, and thank you for coming to this press conference at such short notice. But you will understand why such short notice was given in this matter. What I have to say to you this afternoon, and why we, um, as the opposition, yeah. what I have to say to you this afternoon, and why we, as the opposition, consider this to be extremely important is something that has come to our attention since the passing of the Strategic Services Agency Amendment Bill in the Senate on Tuesday last. And before I get into the actual crux of what you've been called here and what the public, what would be made known to the public this afternoon, I would like to preface what I say to you this afternoon by saying that the democratic process is only so good as the persons who participate in it. And from what I will reveal to you this afternoon, you will see that there is much for us to be worried about with respect to the democratic process that was engaged in the passing of the Strategic Services Amendment, a Strategic Services Agency Amendment Bill. We in Trinidad and Tobago have a written constitution, and that written constitution enshrines the principles of merit, ability, and integrity, the last of those we consider to be extremely important. The Constitution also recognizes in the preamble that men and institutions remain free only when freedom is founded upon respect for moral and spiritual values and the rule of law. And what I will disclose to you this afternoon, you will understand, has a lot to do with a breach of those principles on behalf of persons who have participated in that democratic process of passing the SSA bill. You would know that during the past two months, this bill has been before Parliament and much public debate has transpired about the, the wrongs and the rights, whether this bill actually infringes the fundamental rights the opposition and the independent senators had indicated both in the lower house and in the upper house with respect to the independent senators, that this bill does touch concern and has the ability to breach the fundamental rights under Section 4 and 5 of the Constitution. When the Attorney General piloted the SSA bill, the, the amendment in Parliament, I would like to quote from the Hansard as to what the Attorney, Honorable Attorney General, Mr. Faris al Rawi, had to say. And this was on the 3rd of May, 2016. And I quote, I am very pleased to be back in the Senate this evening, and more particularly pleased to pilot before the Honorable Senators of this Senate and through you to the national community. A very important piece of legislation, one which has its roots in burning issues that grip our country in Trinidad and Tobago right now. Any bill that comes before our Parliament must meet with certain criteria. We are assembled here as a Parliament, a bicameral structure that we pursue under Section 53 of the Constitution, as we are obliged to make laws for the peace, order, and good governance of our country. And I wish to emphasize this part of Mr. Al Rawi's speech. This bill has passed through the House of Representatives. But one may say that, as with any bill, that is simple majority legislation, that the real test to be had is in the Senate. After all, there are other minds and the bipartisan politics which grips our country, and it is with that focus in mind that persuasion has to be had, not so much to the members that you have in any one house, but also to grip in on the bona fides of any bill that you bring. All laws must be democratic within the context of our constitution. All law must be proportionate within the context of our constitution. What I want to disclose to you this afternoon is something that is very disturbing to the opposition and, is and ought to be extremely disturbing to the general public. When the vote was taken on the SSA Amendment Bill, you would have seen that all of the government senators voted for the bill. The opposition voted against it, 
and out of the independent senators, seven of the nine senators voted against the bill. Mr. Roach and Mr. John Kerr voted for the bill. What preceded that was an invitation on Saturday by the Honorable Attorney General so that experts and technocrats can speak to both the opposition and the independent senators. And you would have noticed, and it is in the public domain, as to what transpired with respect to who attended that particular meeting that was called by the Attorney General with respect to the independent senators. We, as the opposition, consider it very disturbing material that has come to hand, whereby independent senator, Mr. Justin John Kerr, was retained by the Attorney General in matters on behalf of the state and remains retained on the payroll of the Attorney General while holding the position of an independent senator. And we consider the fact that Mr. Justin John Kerr was retained in matters by the Attorney General. And that fact was not brought to the attention of the Parliament by the Attorney General or Mr. Justin John Kerr to be a very serious breach of our democracy and the lawmaking process. I will pass to you now documents that demonstrate if these can be handed out. The documents that I have just passed to you are documents, public documents, that are filed in the High Court of Trinidad and Tobago in Civil Claim Number CV 2015-01900, the matter of Eastern Engineering and Marketing Services 1994 Limited, and the Attorney General of Trinidad and Tobago. You will see from these documents that Mr. Justin John Kerr is the advocate attorney retained on behalf of the Attorney General in this matter. Justin John Kerr, Attorney at Law, Suite No. 109, Precision Place, No. 43, Woodford Street, Port of Spain. And they have the particulars of his email address, his mobile and his office telephone number. This document was filed on the 15th of December, 2015. Attached to the bundle that I have provided to you is also another document for an application for an extension of time where Mr. Justin John Kerr is advocate attorney on behalf of the Attorney General again in the said matter. So, when the SSA bill was being debated in Parliament two Tuesdays ago, Mr. Justin John Kerr was sworn in as a temporary independent senator. At no point in time, at the first hearing, when Mr. Justin John Kerr was sworn in as an independent senator, when he made his contribution, that sitting in the Senate two Tuesdays ago lasted eight hours. Mr. Justin John Kerr made his contribution on that day as an independent senator. For eight hours, Mr. Faris al Rawi, the Attorney General, who retained Mr. Justin John Kerr in this matter, who Mr. Justin John Kerr acts on behalf of in this matter, sat there for eight hours and at no point in time did Mr. Faris al Rawi indicate to the Parliament at any point in time, either before the contribution was made, when Mr. Justin John Kerr was sworn in, or at any time thereafter, that Mr. Justin John Kerr was on the payroll of the Attorney General, 
who was the who was the person piloting this bill piloting this bill in the lower house and in the upper house and we find that to be extremely extremely disturbing to the democracy of this country at no point in time did mr justin john k indicate to the parliament that he was on the payroll of the attorney general while this bill is going through the house while it was such an important part to be played by the independent senators and seven seven of the nine independent senators voted against this bill it is a matter of public record now how mr john care voted mr justin john care was one of the persons who attended one of the persons who attended on monday that meeting called by the Attorney General, didn't he think that it was right or proper to disclose to the Attorney General, remind him and to disclose to the public that I, Justin John K., am retained by the Attorney General and I'm on the payroll of the Attorney General while I'm sitting as an independent senator in the Parliament. Faris al Rawi, the Attorney General, has demonstrated again by the actions and inactions in this particular matter his unsuitability to hold the office of Attorney General. I do not think that we need any more evidence to show that Mr. Faris al Rawi, the Honorable Attorney General, really <coughs> ought not to be holding that position of Attorney General. It cannot be right that any attorney general will sit through eight hours of hearing while Mr. Justin John Kay is sitting there in the Senate, almost 11 hours of hearing on the second sitting that was Tuesday gone, sit through the committee stage, and at no point in time did Mr. Faris al Rawi consider it proper that he should disclose to the parliament and to the people of Trinidad and Tobago from all sectors who have voiced their concerns and I want to make the point that when the Honorable Senator Miss Sophia Choate senior counsel began her presentation and it is on the Hansard when she began her presentation on Tuesday last she was the last of the independent speakers remember Miss Sophia Choate began her presentation by saying over the weekend, persons were asking, is she the one? It is in the Hansard. Look at it for yourself. Trinidad and Tobago will look at it themselves. Miss Sophia Choate said many people asked her, is she the one? And she didn't understand what they were speaking about until it re was revealed to her that what is she the one that question really meant. I don't think that as of today, that the, the, the question that was posed to Ms. Choate was an unjustified one. Because now that we have seen that what has transpired, it is really an insult to our democracy by the Attorney General Faris al Rawi to allow this to take place in relation to, a, to any bill, but more particularly this bill in which the voices of the independents spoke on the first day. It was an act of desperation by the Attorney General on Saturday because they understood what was taking place. They understood that there were independent senators, the independent, the truly independent senators were not going to support the Strategic Services Agency Amendment Bill. And if it is that this is what we must come to for the government to pass legislation that we as the opposition and the independent senators considered were in breach of the fundamental rights of the citizens of this country, we are in trouble in Trinidad and Tobago. We are in deep trouble if the Attorney General of this country could <coughs> sit there and know that an independent senator is sitting on the independent bench 
And while he's sitting on the independent bench, he's on the payroll of the Attorney General and not disclose that to the Parliament or the public, we are in real trouble. This, members of the media and, and members of the public, is that straw that has broken the camelback with respect to this Attorney General. This was the same Attorney General, Faris al Rawi, who indicated in no uncertain terms to the Parliament that the people of Trinidad and Tobago have no right to privacy. And in wrapping up, he came with a very lame excuse to try and cover what was an embarrassing statement by a sitting Attorney General. This is the same Faris al Rawi, who went pressed by the opposition to produce one of the cases, produce a case that says that the citizens of this country don't have a right to privacy, comes to the parliament with a private law case again, between two individuals and says this is evidence. Frank C. Passat's judgment. My brother Senator, Mr. Wayne Sturge, has issued a press release today addressing that issue and the embarrassing act of Mr. al Rawi in coming to Parliament with a private law case that has nothing to do with the constitutional right to privacy and seek to justify his own misstatement. It was too little and too late. This is the same Faris al Rawi who went in Parliament and said on the Hansard in piloting this bill in the lower house that the government had paid out millions of dollars in the state of emergency matters, millions of taxpayers' dollars, when challenged in the parliament that not one cent <coughs> was paid by the government. He had no answer, not even an excuse he could have produced. This is the same Faris al Rawi who has gone in, in post cab and in the public domain and said, You need a warrant. You need a warrant to intercept communications under the Interception of Communications Act. We now know that was mere folly because in the meeting that we had with Colonel Robinson, who is the director of the SSA, he told us in no uncertain terms that he needs no warrant to intercept communication under Section 6 of the Interception of Communication Act. This is the same Faris al Rawi who last night on a particular media station, on a live interview, when asked by a member of the media, can you tell us the mechanism in the act to show how this de-siloing of information is going to work. How is the commissioner of police? How is the head of customs and excise? And how is the chief of defense staff? What requires them to bring and give all their information to the SSA? Couldn't say one word to answer that question. Kept going round and round and round as he always does. Like I described him, a mind of useless information. Faris al Rawi. This is the same Faris al Rawi who promised to make the Solicitor General Carol Hernandez advice public so that the independent and the government senators could have seen what the Solicitor General said about whether this act breaches the rights of the citizens of this country. To date, Mr. Faris al Rawi has not produced that um, opinion to any of us, either the independents or the members of the opposition. So, members of the media and the public of Trinidad and Tobago, enough is enough. We have endured the missteps of this Attorney General for far too long, and we are not going to endure it anymore. What I have produced to you today, what I have shown to you by documents that have been filed in the High Court, shows how this government treats our democracy and our democratic process. It is an insult to our democratic process. It is a fundamental breach of the rule of law that underpins our constitution for this to have taken place with respect to a piece of law that was so important where the vote of an independent senator held a balance between the government and the opposition. Our constitution in, makes provision for political affiliations. That is why the constitution enacts that you have independent senators in our bicameral system. That is why 
you can pass legislation by a simple majority in the lower house. But like Mr. Al-Rawi indicated in opening, in opening the debate on this bill in the upper house, Mr. Al-Rawi himself sat there, looked at Mr. Justin John K. sitting as an independent senator and shamelessly said to the parliament that this in the upper house is where you must persuade persons. You must persuade them to support you. Is this the way that this government is going to persuade independent senators to support them? Is it not right that an attorney general sitting there and knowing that an independent senator is on your payroll had the right, had the responsibility to the parliament and to the people of Trinidad and Tobago to get up and indicate to the parliament, indicate to us, the opposition, and indicate to the independent senators that one of your own is on my payroll. And I don't consider that to be right. But if Faris al-Rawi considers this to be right, our democracy is under threat. The rule of law is under threat. Faris al-Rawi, after this press conference today and after this is made public, should do the right thing and resign. Tender his resignation because he has shown yet again this is a yet another occasion where he has shown he's unfit to hold the office of Attorney General. Att the office of Attorney General is not one that requires you to dress nice and sound like if you know what you're talking about because Faris al-Rawi has been exposed by the opposition and by the independent bench in this debate to show that all of, all of the eloquence that he demonstrates every time he gets up has very little substance. But this doesn't have to do with substance. This has to do with our democracy. This has to do with the rule of law. This that has transpired here is a betrayal of the trust that the people of Trinidad and Tobago put in us as a parliament, put in us to represent their best interests. And it is a betrayal of the Constitution, because the Constitution enacts that we should enact laws for the goodwill of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And it is a betrayal. What has happened here is a betrayal on the people of Trinidad and Tobago. It is a misuse of our democracy. This ought not to have taken place. And now that it has been exposed for what it really is, we expect that Mr. Al-Rawi will do the honourable thing. And if he doesn't, we expect that the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Keith Christopher Rowley, will do what he has always promised to do. He always has said, where you have evidence, bring it. We have brought the evidence today. We have brought the evidence today to show that his Attorney General sat in the Senate for almost 20 hours of debate, knowing that an independent senator was on his payroll and did nothing about it. He sent out an invitation to Mr. Justin John Kerr to attend a meeting and didn't think at any point in time that that was improper. We cannot stand for that. We as an opposition will not stand for that. And the people of Trinidad and Tobago will not stand for that. What has transpired here is the end of the road for Mr. Faris al-Rawi. We hope that he will do the honorable thing. We hope that his fellow senators will convince him to do the proper thing. And if he doesn't, like we said, we hope that the Prime Minister will be the last bastion of hope for us as a people and remove Mr. al-Rawi from the position that he now holds as Attorney General. Members of the media for coming here for the role that you continue to play as the bastion of, democ of, of our democracy, as the fourth estate. And I commend you for the good work that you have done in relation to the matters that, are, that have come to light with respect to the SSA, both in the lower house and in the upper house, and to continue to allow the public to educate the public and be a means by which the public can know what is transpiring in our democracy. Now, apart from the principle of, you know, that this looks wrong and uh, a breach of morals, is it actually a breach of the law 
and if so, like you know, this whole parliament procedure of voting, if somebody has this undisclosed interest, or you know, or do you say, well, the thing done happened already, and an undisclosed interest is so tenuous that there's nothing to be done about it? I think where our constitution enshrines in the preamble, like I read out to you, our constitution enshrines and is based upon the principle of integrity. What has transpired here is a fundamental breach of the integrity that is enshrined in our preamble to our constitution. It's deeper than that because what has happened here is a breach of the rule of law. That is what has transpired here. It is a breach of our democracy as a people that is enshrined in our constitution. And what has transpired here is a breach of section of the preamble as well as what was referred to by Mr. Al Rawi, section 53 of the constitution. So yes, what has transpired here is not a mere breach of the law. What has transpired here is a strike at our democracy, which goes far further far far further than a breach of any law because it is what our constitution and what we as a people strive on and keeps us together as a democracy is, is there any mechanism any particular mechanism to try and annul the vote well that is a very very um good question mr chantak and uh, uh, sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um what we propose to do as an opposition is that we are going to write to His Excellency, the President. It is His Excellency, the President, who made the appointment of Mr. Justin John K. And we will leave it to His Excellency to do what he considers to be right and proper in the circumstances. As I indicated to you, these are matters that came to our attention at about lunchtime today. We have not really had the time, but we thought it important enough to bring it to the attention of the public. We will now take these documents and look carefully as to whether there is a breach of any of the provisions of the Integrity in Public Life Act, whether there is any remedy that, can, um, that resides in the powers, whether they be constitutional powers or any other power that His Excellency may have. And we will also bring it to the attention of the President of the Senate, because as the presiding officer, it would not be right for such to have taken place and the president of the Senate, who is the presiding officer, not know about what has transpired. I think just for my own clarity and just for when I'm writing for the public as well, so, so what you're saying is that you, you are still going to work out whether or not there is a, a mechanism in the laws of the land that can possibly affect the validity of the vote? How, how does that well, that, what, I don't think. We've looked at it very short, but I don't think that something like this has transpired <coughs> before. And I don't know that the framers of the Constitution and the drafters of the Constitution ever thought that something like this would have transpired. So that from a very cursory look at the Constitution, there does not seem to be a mechanism, as it has been described, for dealing with a matter of this nature. But one would expect that if something like this were to take place, whether it be the President of the Senate, whether it be the Prime Minister or whether it be His Excellency himself, one of the heads of these different authorities, whether it be the legislature or the executive, must have some power that resides in them because something like this cannot be allowed to happen in a democracy like ours and it, there is no remedy for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. This is not about the opposition. This is not about the independent <coughs> bench. But you see, what is important about this is simply this. Seven members of the independent bench spoke out. Ms. Choate indicated at the beginning of her speech, people were asking you, are you the one? There will be other things. There may be other things. I have seen things in, in, on social media that are, in, that are in the public domain that affects this, this process. It cannot be right. It cannot be right for someone to be sitting as an independent senator. We are entitled to be partisan. I was an opposition senator. But in this particular bill, we made it a point as an opposition to say, let us put the politics aside. And while we were clamoring for us to put the politics aside, let us 
get this law right. Let us do what is right for Trinidad and Tobago. Let us get the amendments in. Let us strengthen the legislation. While we were clamoring for that as the opposition, what we didn't know was what was going on behind the scenes while the Attorney General was sitting there and Mr. Justin John K was sitting there. And not one of them, not one of them saw it right and proper to inform the House. How could it not, how could it ever be right for Mr. Al Rawi to sit through the first sitting, sit through the second sitting, sit through the committee stage, sit through the meeting that was held on Monday and all these times knowing fully well that Mr. Justin John K, an independent whose vote you want, the government knew they needed that vote. That is why on the Saturday midstream in the debate, Mr. Al Rawi seeks to have a meeting with the opposition and the independents. Is it all a coincidence that Mr. Justin John K was one of the two senators who attended that meeting? Should the president have known about this matter before he made the appointment? I don't think that it is. I don't think one could have expected His Excellency to know what would have transpired because matters that are pertaining to the Attorney General's office, one cannot reasonably expect His Excellency to know about that. But one would have expected that when Mr. Justin John Kay was approached in this matter to sit as a temporary senator, that the right and proper thing to do, because the matter, the, the, the bill had already been passed in the lower house. Mr. Justin John Kay would have known who was piloting the bill, the man he works for. He would have known that the man that he works for, on whose payroll he is on, would be piloting the bill in the Senate. And if we take for granted all of that, when he sat in the Senate on the first day, two Tuesdays ago, and Mr. Al Rawi got up and said what I just quoted, that his role is to persuade the independent senators, would it not have been right for Mr. Justin John K to get up and say, Members of the House, I am on the payroll of the Attorney General. I am retained by the Attorney General in matters that are presently ongoing before the court. Do any one of you on the government or independent or my fellow independent, the opposition bench, have any objection to me participating in this debate? How hard would it have been for him to do that? It, what people forget in this country is that to do the right thing is not very difficult. It is sometimes always easier to do the right thing than to do the wrong thing. But when the wrong thing is exposed, you can see what will be the consequences. Today as we sit here and I speak to you as the media, we don't know how far this can reach. We don't know what exactly would be the consequences of it. But what we do know is a serious wrong has been perpetrated on our parliament and our democratic process. And one would expect that now that it has been exposed, those that have not done what they were supposed to do before will do what they are supposed to do now. And like I've said before, it is not difficult to understand in these circumstances what is the right thing to do. If, um, if the opposition is, you know, this question about the constitutional majority required a special or simple majority, um, well, first question is, is the opposition going to take the question to court to just let a law court decide if it's a, if it needs a special or simple majority? And then secondly is, could this be part of a case, you know, saying, well, you know, they probably didn't even get, you know, this vote was kind of dubious, you know, could that be roped into a court case? Well, we, as the opposition, have indicated that if Mr. Faris al Rawi, if he continues to be Attorney General after today, and if he chooses to not heed the concerns of the independent senators and the concerns of the opposition and the concerns of the people of Trinidad and Tobago, and if this bill, because there is a proclamation clause and it, it still has to be assented by His Excellency, so the process is such that it has to be assented to and then there's a proclamation clause that brings it into effect. And if it is, 
that this bill is proclaimed in the form that it presently is in, the opposition has indicated quite clearly and cut uncut um, clearly that they will challenge this bill, the provisions of this bill, and the breaches of the fundamental rights that we say this bill perpetrates all the way to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. I want to make it very clear last night in an interview with the media, the Honorable Attorney General said that the opposition is making mere threats. This is not a threat. The opposition has shown that where there is an illegality perpetrated on the people of Trinidad and Tobago, we will take action. We have a proper legal team that will put together a motion to deal with the illegality that is committed on the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And I think from the reputation of the lawyers that are on the opposition bench, Mr. al Rawi will do well to not treat this as an empty threat. Because we will take this all the way to the Privy Council. Because we are convinced, not only we, but the, the independent bench, Ms. Truth, <coughs> a respected senior counsel in this country, described this bill as a shell when she made her contribution in the Senate. Mr. al Rawi should have been ashamed that a leading member of the inner bar would describe legislation that he brings to the Parliament as a shell. So we have no doubt that this bill in its current form, and I can indicate now, to just clear the way for Mr. al Rawi to understand, that we will strike down any legislation that infringes the rights of the citizens of this country. He said we, we, are, making a, we, are, we are mistakenly um, alleging that the SSA bill is, um, breaches the constitutional rights of the citizens when really interception is really the interception of communications are. Well, I can tell Mr. Al-Rawi that the opinion of the opposition is that both pieces of legislation, both pieces of legislation infringe the rights of the citizen. And our position is if something was done wrong before, we are here as an opposition to fix it. And if it is, we have to strike down both pieces of legislation, which we consider breaches the fundamental rights of the citizen, we'll strike down both of them. And he can bring his team of lawyers, and we'll travel all the way across the Atlantic to the Judicial Committee to do it. The General will be able to defend himself by saying that he runs a law and share on portfolio, and he, he does not have personal knowledge of each and every person in his employee. Ms. Woodram, the position is simply this. The Attorney General has responsibility over his ministry. As I understand the practice in the Attorney General's office, one is not retained as external counsel in the Attorney General's office without the signing off of that by the Attorney General. The I understand the process to be that a recommendation is made by the Solicitor General on the file to the Attorney General, and then the Attorney General signs off on it. So if Mr. Al Rawi, as he has shown at times, is not aware of what is going on in his ministry. We cannot be blamed for that. He must take responsibility for it because this matter is a matter that emanates out of his ministry. This is a matter where Mr. John Kerr is not led by senior counsel. He's advocate attorney. He's advocate attorney on behalf of the attorney general. So that had to be signed off by whoever is sitting in that chair. And as of this moment, we hold Mr. Al Rawi responsible because as of what we are concerned about, Ms. Budam, is simply this, you know. When this was going on, Mr. John K was on the payroll of the Attorney General. And that is what strikes at the heart of our democracy. While sitting as an independent senator, he was on the payroll of the Attorney General. And that is what is wrong. And that is what the Attorney General should have corrected. From the time Mr. Al Rawi, two Tuesdays ago, saw Mr. John K walk up to take the oath. He should have said something to the presiding officer. The right and proper thing to do was to simply step aside and say, Mr. John Kerr, are you not retained in matters on behalf of my ministry? I'm going to pilot this bill and you're going to sit as an independent senator. Just one, sure. one more thing. But at the end of the day, the possibility exists that whether or not the attorney general is removed or Mr. John Kerr is removed as an independent senator, the bill could still come to pass and settle on the country? Well, we have the experience of Section 34 that the People's National Movement never let rest even after the Honourable Prime Minister who was sitting as Prime Minister at that time 
got up at two o'clock in the morning, convened Parliament, and revoked Section 34. And the revocation of Section 34 was challenged all the way to the Judicial Committee, and the government was vindicated. So if Dr. Keith Christopher Rowley wants to match the integrity of Ms. Kamala Prasad Bisesa, what he should do as Prime Minister is take steps to revoke what has been passed in Parliament and give the country and the Parliament an opportunity to debate this bill without being tainted by what I have disclosed here today. Like I've said, when Section 34 was passed, the Honourable Prime Minister at the time, Ms. Kamala Prasad Bisesa, sat with the Attorney General, convened Parliament within 24 hours and revoked it. Let us see. Let us see. History has a funny way of repeating itself. Let us see if Dr. Keith Christopher Rowley, the Honourable Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, will do a similar thing. We're not waiting for any investigation to take place. There's no need for any investigation. The facts are plain and simple. What transpired on Tuesday should not have transpired. And this is worse than Section 34. So, let the PNM now test itself and its principles by all of the criticisms that they lay at the feet of the People's Partnership. And let us see if Dr. Keith Christopher Rowley or the Acting Prime Minister is going to call Mr. al Rawi into a meeting this afternoon. Let us see if they will convene Cabinet this afternoon. Let us see if tomorrow they will convene Parliament and say, let us undo the wrong that was done on Tuesday. Let us test the democracy. Let us test the fairness and let us test the principles upon which this government stands as the government of Trinidad and Tobago. And the people of Trinidad and Tobago will now see whether the criticisms that were leveled against the partnership when Section 34 was passed, let us see if the interest groups will come out and cry for the SSA bill to be revoked by the Parliament. It is a ripe opportunity today to see whether what Dr. Keith Christopher Rowley said to the people of Trinidad and Tobago on the 9th of the, on the, 9th of the 7th of September 2015 is really PR or really what he stands by. Because there is only one answer to this Midwood Round. Only one answer. This bill must be revoked. And whatever the executive has to do in order to get it revoked and pass it back in whatever form, they must do it. Because that is the minimum that the people of Trinidad and Tobago are entitled to. The very minimum. So I think this is a matter that the media ought to bring to the attention of the public and let the democracy of Trinidad and Tobago be tested. Let the government of Trinidad and Tobago be tested. And let us see whether they will meet the same standard that was set by the partnership with respect to Section 34. This, this is not Section 34. This is the SSA Amendment Bill where you, what you have, the mistrust and what was perpetrated on the parliament is not in relation to one section, it is in relation to an entire act. Let the PNM now come and see whether they will stand up to that standard. I said it before and I stand by it again today. This is worse than section 34. Let us see whether the government will undo the SSA. Seven senators, Senator Mahabir, Senator Shrikisun, Senator Choate, Senator Raful, Senator Kreese, Senator Richards, and Senator Ram Kisun all spoke out and voted against this bill. And let the media and the public ask now, why did the independents who voted on that day vote that way? And let us test it and see. Thank you, members of the media, for coming this afternoon, and I wish you all the best.